For a normal person getting a half volley outside off stump, switching your feet and reverse sweeping a seam bowler for six would be the most incredible thing that you do that day. And this shot of Glenn Maxwell is absolutely wild. But compared to what happened at the end of his innings, it is almost room temperature water. As this was happening, people were wondering how good this knock was. Pat Cummins said this. Yeah, I think that's the greatest ODI innings. I mean, I've ever seen. It's probably the greatest ODI innings ever. Um... Recency bias and the fact he stood at the other end like the world's most overpaid cheerleader will obviously pay a part in why he thought that. But he is not alone. So the questions I think are worth asking are, is this the best knock by someone down the order? Is this the best knock by an Australian? Is this the best knock at a World Cup? And I suppose most importantly, is this the best knock ever played in one day cricket? This video is brought to you by Wicket Cricket Manager. This show was made by HCL Tech, a company that believes in partnerships so much you can read their name on the Australian shirt. This show leans in hard on data and technology, so we are proud to work with HCL Tech, leaders in their field. Firstly, we need to get to how the game was set up. Because what Maxwell did was crazy, but it started a long time before that. In fact, this game had historical consequences even before Maxwell hit the crease. That is because Ibrahim Zadran played an elegant anchor innings in which he carried his bat, for, in ODI terms at least, for all 50 overs. And why is this important? Because it was the first 100 in World Cups by Afghanistan. A team known for their bowling took their first real step towards maturation with this three-figure effort. Also, it's worth saying that no one else made 30, so Afghanistan's score of 291 was largely on his back. This meant that their larger scores against the big three nations all came at this World Cup. They have approached, but not yet breached, 300 in all three matches. And this was even more than they set and defended against England. There was one catch. They entered their defense with only one frontline seamer, Navin al Haq. But luckily for them, he did everything they needed with the new ball, including this incredible one to Travis Head. But their other seamer, their batting around the Ashmatullah Omazai, actually took David Warner with a peach of a delivery that the Reverend showed no respect for at all. So between them, they actually picked up four early wickets. Not bad for a lone paceman and his sixth bowling friend. Australia were in all sorts. But the reason Afghanistan had no pace is because they went with extra spin. And that also got them wickets. Marcus Stoyne has played a reverse sweep when he basically never does. So that was an odd choice. They lost another wicket to spin when Stark decided not to review a court behind. That definitely hit the stump and not his back. Marnus was also run out when he took too long to respond to a Maxwell call. So when Stark walked off incorrectly, Australia were 91 for 7. Depending on your favourite win predictor, I'm pretty sure that most of them might have said that Australia had 0% chance of chasing this. In fact, if you tallied up all of Australia's last three batters' top scores in ODI cricket, they still wouldn't account for half of what Australia needed which was 201 runs from 31.3 overs. The only advantage they had is that they had been scoring quick and that Maxwell was already on 22. But his innings almost never started. He entered when Omar Zahoe was on a hat trick and first ball, Afghanistan actually thought they had him, but it was bat and not pad. But that wasn't even his only close call. Maxwell mashes up a slog sweep and ends up slicing it in the air and in the confusion, no Afghanistani actually gets to it properly. And Maxwell did another one. This one straight to Majib, who might be one of the worst fielders in the world, and to absolutely no surprise, dropped another catch at short fine leg. That same over, Maxwell was given out LBW. And you can see that when he saw the replay, he actually started walking. But somehow, the ball was bouncing over the top of the stumps instead, and so Hawkeye saved him. And it seems that all these chances and let-offs meant that Maxwell just thought he might as well swing. And for a while, he plays the innings in a fairly normal way. Well, not normal compared to other batters, but Maxwell Ball. In many ways, he gets a free pass in an innings like this. The team can only lose, and so his best chance is just to play his game, swing through the line, take chances, and to basically score on his own. That is a perfect situation for him. And at the other end, he had moral support and little else from Pat Cummins. Like the best scoring shot that Cummins played was when he missed this ball and it went for four buys. In fact, Crick Info's match impacts that suggests that all things considered, Cummins was a negative on the game. Though to be fair, it doesn't have a very good metric for a guy who blocks out for his partner at the other end in a one day game. But I don't want you to think that Cummins did nothing special. This was the longest innings he had ever played and it wasn't even close. And you wanna know how much Cummins was willing to bleed for this innings? His strike rate dropped by seven points while playing it. 
and he could have scored more if Maxwell had been able to run or even walk at the end of his innings. There's some incredible stats here, like this was the fifth highest partnership ever for the seventh wicket. Also, it was the most in a World Cup, and that might not sound incredible, but it allows me to show you this. Pat Cummins made 12 runs in the partnership, and Glenn Maxwell made 179. It's less a partnership and more one person was working and the other person was supervising. And Maxwell certainly put in the work. He made the most runs ever by a player batting at number six or lower in a one-day international, breaking Kapil Dev's 40-year-old record. He became the 11th player to score a double hundred in ODI cricket. And I think this is the very cool bit. And while that is pretty cool, that is nowhere near the whole story. This was actually the most runs when not opening ever. And also the first double hundred ever scored, not by openers. That it happened for number six, and not say three or four, is a huge thing. And this is the highest score when chasing ever. And I suppose you could add also in a successful chase if you wanted. But it is incredible to think that no one has ever made more than this in a second innings. And also, it is just the highest score ever by an Australia. Which considering this is a team with five ODI World Cups is pretty amazing. That it was from a player that they spent years trying to muzzle to turn into their kind of player is even more freaky. And this is all the players with 500 runs in World Cups. And I have put two dots in for Maxwell. The green one was before today, when he had an average of 40 and a strike rate of 162. The blue one is after this innings. Now his runs per wicket is virtually 50, but his strike rate actually went down today. Even before this innings, he was one of the biggest outliers in World Cup batting ever, and the fastest scorer in World Cups by a huge margin. And to finish off the stats, in his career, outside of the World Cup, he has 100. In the World Cups, he now has three. It would appear like the big show likes the big show. And he certainly gave one here. After all that time in the Mumbai humidity, his body began to give way. The man who couldn't sit on a golf cart recently was now shriveling into a small hairy troll that had been thrown into a fire. Cramp is obviously something we have seen a lot of this World Cup, and you could certainly bat through it. But the difference here was that if he didn't make the runs, that was it. Australia was going to lose. There was no one else. And so he batted on. But he did so without running. So that meant for a time, while Australia needed runs, could not. So if the first part of his innings he attacked with a free pass from the drops and also the situation. Well, in the second part of his innings, it was something entirely different where he had to change how he batted. He just ended up with this violent, nailed up freedom. Well, actually, freedom is probably the wrong way of saying it because he was locked into the batting position like someone was holding him down. And at this point, Maxwell was little more than incredibly hairy arms trying to catch up with the ball. Look at these feet. They should not allow him to hit the ball this hard. He's standing like a woman who just hurt her back moving a couch, and he's hitting the ball like Barry Bonds. This is not a normal thing to do, but of course, this was not a normal innings. So the question from the top was quite simple. So the question from the top was quite simple. Is this the best ODI innings of all time? But how do you answer that when you are still lying in the wet spot of recency bias? Well, let's give it a go. I have a rough list of the best hundreds ever made in World Cups, and also a few more from ODIs. The trickiest ones, I think, are the World Cup finals. You've got Collis King and Clive Lloyd, and not to mention Ben Stokes, Ricky Ponting, Aravinda De Silva, and Adam Gilchrist have all played worthy best innings of all time knocks in World Cup finals. And I don't know how you rate an innings in a World Cup final compared to a normal one. But what else has there been in the World Cups? Well, A.B. de Villiers played the extraordinary innings against the West Indies in 2015, and Martin Guptill hit the highest score in the tournament against those teams. I think those are both incredible, but I'm not sure either one goes past this innings. So then you have the two knocks that are the most similar in World Cups. Kapil Dev scoring all of India's runs after there were 17 for 5 against Zimbabwe in 1983, and Kevin O'Brien chasing England's tail without his top order in 2011. Let's leave those slightly aside for a moment. What about outside the World Cups? I think Sachin breaking cricket's four-minute mile by scoring the first double hundred was something definitely worthy of mention, but I don't think it's quite on the level of some of these others. Herschel Gibson, the world record game, was absolutely alien to how we saw cricket, and Sanas 189 was also pretty special. But I do think there is one innings from outside World Cups that has to be mentioned here. In 1984, Viv Richards came in at 11 for two against England and saw his team fall to 110 for seven, and then also 166 for 9 when he batted with Mike Holding. But the West Indies would end up with 272, of which Richards would make 189 from only 170 balls. That sentence doesn't even make sense in 1984. 
And so for me right now, without doing loads and loads of research on it, I think the four best innings of all time in one day cricket would have to be Kapil Dev, Kevin O'Brien, Viv Richards, and I think this one from Glenn Maxwell. And it's worth pointing out some of the differences here. Kapil Dev wasn't chasing. O'Brien never lost as many batters early as Maxwell did. And Viv was batting first. Also, crucially, none of them did it while cramping or not being able to run. This was an injured player who couldn't run with a blocking tail ender against two of the most economical bowlers in a World Cup. And it was also a double hundred from the number six position with a strike rate of 157. Now, in almost any big ODI score, there's going to be caveats. And Afghanistan panicked massively here. They dropped him, they missed out on an unlucky DRS, and were probably a seam short on an incredibly flat wicket. But I'm pretty sure you could make similar claims for the other three innings as well. So is this the greatest ODI innings of all time? How the hell do you want me to make that call in the sexy afterglow of what we just saw? But this is what I know. It certainly fits the profile of an innings that could be the greatest of all time. Side in trouble, scores all the runs on his own, is injured, wins the game. Years ago, I got in an argument with my editor over a Maxwell innings. He said he wanted the emotion of the hundred. And I wrote a piece about how it was like watching a real-life cartoon character play cricket. I think that's the thing with Maxwell. There's always something for everyone. And in his last over, as he was still hunched over at the crease, he gave us a double hundred and winning runs, all while looking shriveled up and stuck to the crease by superglue. I presented the case for whether this is the best ODI innings or not. You can make your own decision. But there is one thing we can all agree on. This was not an innings by a normal person. 